Happy Monday. How's everybody doing? Doing well, Joe. Uh, welcome, Jean-Georges. Jean-Georges. Hey, guys. guys. <laughs> Hello. Great having you with us. That's thanks, awesome. Thanks. Huh? Yeah, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Um, wonderful weekend, recovering from surgery. So, you know, all good. It's all good. Oh, good for you. Yeah, that was actually, uh, yeah, I'm glad you're doing okay. That was a... Uh, um, one of the concerns, I was like, I hope he does a does all right with everything. So I can I cannot yell anymore uh, because I used to be a yeller, so they they had to to cut some things, but uh, I still can't express myself. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty hilarious. Um, well, it's not hilarious, but it's hilarious. Um, so surgery is less hilarious, but yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, I hey, got my voice back too. They had a, they had a fridge. Okay, so so I had to spend a night over there, and they had a fridge with. Unlimited yogurts. I've never eaten that many yogurts, and they were free. I, I, they're probably going to show on my bill at some point, but I loved it. <laughs> so so it was good. not that painful. It's good probiotics, though. So it's, <laughs> exactly, uh, it's I needed it. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, show show people who uh, don't know who you are. Do you want to give a quick intro? Yeah, so so I'm I'm a software engineer by training, but I think I self-identify as a data engineer these days. Um, I, I started my career in a lot of development tools, which gave me the idea of really focusing on developer productivity. I, I love that. Okay, so uh, I love that people are more productive. They they feel more empowered. They feel better. They feel that they're valued. Um, I've been an entrepreneur in France until 2014, and then uh, something happened, and I decided to come here. Um, and um, and uh, since then, I've been a consultant. I worked in Fortune 500, in smaller companies, uh, and now I'm back to being uh, to starting uh, to to be an entrepreneur again. So oh, pretty exciting, pretty exciting time. Yeah, thanks. Um, right, so, so I'm going to ask maybe an unplanned question here, but this brings up for me. Um, from your perspective, what are the differences between like the startup scene in France and the startup scene in the United States? Because I've been reading a lot lately about how the startup scene in France is actually really up and coming right now. Like it's doing quite well, from what I understand. Well, so 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 I've been the first startup I created was in '94. Um, '94, oh, wow. yeah, um, and. Uh, um, and I still don't have my youth, okay? So you can imagine that I've not been that successful, financially speaking, at least. The the main difference between the fr France and the U.S. is the access to capital. It's a little bit changing uh, in France now because... The, so, f for example, when you're thinking about Silicon Valley, right? The thing is... Um, People made money. They reinvested in more people. They reinvested in people that would trust, and they they created the startups, and and you start up this, this virtual circle of money coming in, coming out, coming in, coming out. Okay, and, and taking a risk, and because this was kind of the culture in in Europe, especially in the part of France where I'm coming from, it was more old money. Okay, you, you get money because you had uh, an industrial capacity or you add money because you were in retail but you did not have money because not a lot of money made money on services and it's and those new technologies were kind of a, a little bit intimidating so access to capital was really difficult and this pump you know this was not really primed yet now in france in paris mainly i would say with with things like station f and and the, um and the things are changing a little bit so so you, you you see you see more capital but it's i think it's still it's still more fun here because the mentality you know it's how much your customers do in, in france they say oh you're innovative that's great what's your track record okay uh yeah. where where in the us hey yo oh, you're innovative what am I winning with you? Okay. What mm -hmm. are we winning together? And I think this this kind of a question is a little bit the the, the different mindset here. So, well, the, there's a mindset around failure too. I noticed in Europe, where if you fail as a business person or an entrepreneur, it, it's not as accepted as it is here. Maybe that's changing, but I know in my travels throughout Europe, um, there's just a different attitude towards failure. Like that's as simple as I can put it. So, 
yeah it, it changes slowly but there is there is that and you know and and define failure okay so fail right. because in, in the us it, it was fun actually i had a discussion with a vc once in in san francisco and there was panel discussion so someone asked a question about a hey do you take people that already fail that failed and the guy said yeah i even prefer them because i don't want to pay for learning <laughs> yeah that's such an awesome point yeah there's there's a situation you got to pay yeah so so now i'm seasoned in uh failures awesome well, okay. <laughs> the next one's a success but you know if not, you're in a country at least you can keep trying at it i mean yeah I mean, what colonel sanders started kfc when he was 65 um so uh you know he didn't take any stock either so he actually died pretty poor relative to his secretary i heard um, but anyway so but yeah, it could happen. Yeah. Um, actually, Val says he can totally re relate. Uh, he has the same experience in the UK. Uh, US companies are a lot more adventurous to try new tech. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny. Matt and I are actually flying both flying to Europe um, today. So, oh, uh, cool! I'll, I'll be at a uh, doing a. There's actually a low key happy hour that I, um, yeah, my friend Jeremy Ravenel is putting on over in Paris. And Matt, you'll be in uh, Geneva. Be in, so, yeah, uh, Geneva and Verbier. So yeah, there's a conference, data conference happening in Verbier. Couple of days. So, 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 so now you guys are a completely bilingual. Um, <laughs> Pass on core. No, I'm the I'm the, the bad American that shows up and expects everyone to speak English. So Matt speaks French. So a, a bit, but I, I still need to. Work uh, comme si, comme ça. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, awesome. So uh, anyway, yeah, it's it's it's. Um, yeah, you've been on my radar for a while. I, I, I don't know how you first came up. I mean, it's with the data mesh community or something like that. And, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's cool to have you on. So I guess um, diving into it, uh, you know, we're talking about modern data engineering standards. Uh, BTOL, is that how you pronounce it? I yeah, BTOL. Yeah. BTOL, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and, and more. Um, so, yeah, what's, what's on your mind these days? Well, so, so you know, I, I came to... I came to data engineering as data engineer a, a thing a little bit later in my career. I've always been involved with with some kind of data at some point. Okay, like you, if you're a software engineer and you say oh, I'm not touching data, you're a bad software engineer. But as a but uh, I was you know I was not. I even kind of kind of admit that at college I hated SQL. Okay, I had a I had a t I had a professor trying to convince me a hey, SQL is great. I say why. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so 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 it's it started a long time ago, but I, I recovered. Okay, uh, like you recover from data science, I recovered from SQL. And um, and um, but anyway, the thing is, um, what I kind of realize is that we've been doing data in a very ad hoc way for a long time. Um, like, oh, I need this data, please do it, and and we ended up creating thousands of pipelines and i've been at companies where they have hundreds of thousands of pipelines i just wonder they, they, they just have teams trying to make the inventory of what the pipelines are it's kind of yeah uh it is it is it is ugly um and so the thing is we need to change this the way we do things right and what what i've what i've seen is that a lot of vendors come and say oh we've got the miracle solution so you've got the um, you've got the Atlans, the IBM, the Oracle of the world, and, and all of them, they come to you and say, we have this, the miracle solution. And they probably have, okay? So they probably have, but it doesn't take into account what the existing things are, okay? So the existing nature of the beast uh, and, and the evolution and the change of mentality and all those things. So I think this is where we need to have more than a technology change and more like a, a way of thinking change and, and that's mm -hmm. why i think this is this is a difference for me between modern data engineering and you know modern data stack for example okay which is just a bunch of tools but the practice itself of engineering is evolving and i think it's it's not like it's going oh it's not like it's oh it's 20 years late because it doesn't do agile compared to a software right. uh, i think it has to it has to evolve differently because it's a different beast okay but definitely inject more agile into it okay so that that's that's my current line of thinking and i think that what what drove me into into btol so btol is a, a project um by the linux foundation uh and the idea of this project is to standardize 
standards, sorry, uh, around around modern data engineering, and and one of those standards is data contract. But it's not the only one we've got on our scope or radar of of that. It could be also um, data products eventually data mesh, or it could be the way tools interact with each other. Okay, so to try to standardize this medium of communication between tools and teams so that the, the, the focus is not on changing the, the payload, okay, or, or changing the, the having teams that change one message format to another message format, but rather having a, a more interoperable environment. And that's the ambition of Beetle. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting, like I would say broadly in the tech industry for an industry that prides itself on being the leading edge of technology, we actually do a lot of manual labor. And in data, we do a lot of manual labor. And things like data contracts, fantastic idea. We still have a lot of work to do to get those widely deployed, I feel like. But standards are a really great start. <laughs> Yeah, and they I think I think standards free innovation in a way. Okay. So so you, all this energy you have to, towards your project, instead of just coping with I've got to modify something and, and move it to something or just do another data pipeline, I can actually reuse the standards, communicate more easily with the teams, with the tools. And, and innovate. Okay, so one example I, I I really love when we started. So we so we started Beetle. We we had a um, you know it's a it's a open source open standard project. So you've got a technical steering committee, uh, a tra very traditional way of doing things. And um, uh, a guy came came to us, uh, Peter Fluke, and and Peter uh, was just. Okay, I'm I'm interested in joining, and I've got this thing. I said, okay, well, wh what is your thing? And he said, well, I'm doing um, I'm doing data generation. I said, <laughs> okay, you're doing data generation, so basically, you know, synthetic data and and data for developers and things like that. So I love the idea. I love I love that. It's 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 one way of you know doing having right the right data for tests and things like that. Um, and he's using data contracts to to generate the data, okay. So his input to his tool is to is to generate that. That's 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 the kind of example of innovation that I find is super pragmatic, super efficient, and um, and uh, yeah, I, lo I love I love I love that it's going there. So that's cool. Yeah. Now let me back up and ask you, uh, what to you is a data contract? That's a term that's I think used a ton these days. Um, I think that there are, are a few different versions of, of what data contracts mean to people. Yeah. Um, and by the way, you also wrote the definitive guide on data contracts. Yes. Um, so it's uh, very thick. Yes. Um, so uh, <laughs> dive into that. It's actually, it's actually good. Um, but yeah, what, what does a data contract mean to you? Well, I, for, first, first, um, we, we always a term to Andrew Jones, but I never really liked the term um, um, because I think it's it's a little bit, you know, when you're speaking about contracts, you're you're thinking about something that potentially has has a lot of implications somewhere, right? Or is that a that okay? The f the first guy that comes to you and say, "Hey, here's your contract," you kind of run away. So the first reflex you have, really, so, I do. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, lawyers, the lawyers have gotten involved. Run the interview as quickly. They as ruined possible. it all for everybody. <laughs> And, and and the second thing is it's 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 data. So it's it's the, the it's not only about data. And and the thing is it's it's a little bit like a like when you're thinking about Jamak Degani's you know four principles for data mesh, the federated computational um, governance. Yep. I, I I like to think about uh, about the data contracts like a little bit like a computational brochure. Okay. So mm. so so and and this is basically creating the link between a data producer and data consumer eventually with an s okay and hopefully more more as possible at consumers but as um but that that's the idea okay creating creating this artifact that is on which you will 
trust but it, it doesn't have to be a contract as as you know set in stone like uh but but more like a brochure like hey this is the advertisement for my for, for my data this is how it behaves this is the sla you're expecting out of it um and and um and I, that's how i see it okay yeah, and, yeah. And so so i'm not too much into the enforcing i know that some people are into the enforcement of data contracts <sighs> Yeah, I, I I never wanted to be a cop when I grew up. So so. <laughs> There's a cop on this book though. The other book, Data Mesh for All Ages. So I don't know, George. Well, I respect, <laughs> I respect cops. But there's also a firefighter and a dog. <laughs> um, all jobs that you should aspire to in the data world, by the way, because this is what we do a lot. Um, so, but the uh, yeah, the notion of data contract, I think it's 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 a good one. Um, and it's necessary. I think it's. It's one of those key components that would be necessary for that federated um, computational governance layer that Jamac outlines. I think so. so I think it's one of those there. That's one of the uh, cruxes, I think, um, to making the data mesh work is that piece. And I, or, or I think we're getting there, but it, um, it obviously hasn't. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and yet, so. I, I, I was, I was, you know, I was, I was lucky enough with to to, to work on PayPal's implementation of a of a data mesh, yeah. and uh, uh, so as we were building this thing, we realized, okay, we we need we need some kind of resource descriptor, okay, um, because because we need to we're not going to build a data product and then copy the code and build another data product and etc. We we need to have something like more more dynamic, okay, like. Uh, um, and and that's uh, as, as Jamak describes it, and and so we needed to have something like this resource descriptor, and that's that's how we came out of the idea of oh this this could be a data contract, okay, and that's all, that's how we put all this richness into the data contract to make sure that it covers um, a lot, okay. So yeah. so so that that that's the thing is. You know, you, you ask a question about what is data contract, but there's also what's inside, and and um, mm -hmm. so, so yeah. And Andrew Jones, he says that he thinks uh, it's a good definition that you gave. So, oh, good, I passed. <laughs> <laughs> if if Andrew is okay with me, I, 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 and by the way, Andrew is also in the in the technical steering committee of Beetle. So awesome. I, I it's couldn't have like, there. Yeah, it's a. I couldn't do it without him. So. Yeah, he's a good dude. Um, there's a question here actually. Um, Ellen pointing, aka LinkedIn user, um, is the data contract an equivalent of a service level agreement in IT terms? Uh, it's a, it's a it's a good question. Uh, I know there's a little bit of a confusion at, at times between between the two, but the data contract for me embeds the service levels. So so um, we 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 have eight different sections in, in the data contract, and one of them is the service level. So you define your service levels expectations, uh, and, and then some can be. You know, some some service levels can be like when's the general availability of my data product or my data contract. Okay, so when's the what's the, what's the life cycle? Okay, when when is the end of support, end of life, etc. At least it's documented there. But you can also say, hey, it's a batch, it's a batch, and I'm expecting it um, at 9 a.m. every day. Okay, and that's also where you describe it. So that's so it's it's. When 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 a lot of people when you ask them about SLAs, what they think, oh, it's the number of nines the system has, but it's it's a lot more than that. Okay, so so and I and I I think I hope I I answered the LinkedIn user the anonymous LinkedIn user's questions there. Alan pointing, yeah, uh, but sometimes people's names show up as LinkedIn user, so okay, just, yeah. But speaking of data contracts and data transmission failures, <laughs> touche. <laughs> speak French. Um, so, so walk me through this. So you did you did data mesh at PayPal back in the day. Um, yeah. what, what was walk us through that journey? What what? Why did you start? Why did you do data mesh there? What was the reason? First, first we didn't want to do it. Okay. Uh, um, and and that was back in. Uh, I was I at PayPal in December of uh, twenty one. Uh, twenty one. And um, and uh, the the need we had was was just better data, uh, um, and and to know what's going on, and and a few things that I'm not at liberty to say really, but but PayPal had, as you can imagine, has a lot of data, um, and there's there's 
it says PayPal is a service you use, okay, but there's all this back office risks, uh, um, compliance, et cetera, et cetera, like, like a bank, okay? So a lot of people just say PayPal, see PayPal as a checkout system, which is a fantastic system. And then the back office is a very much like any other company, right? This is where you've got a lot of risk because people try, oh, you're PayPal, so, we're, so you must have money, so we're going to try to steal it. Um, and, and, there's, uh, and there's pretty sophisticated things i was i was working on risk but not on risk like oh your transaction is declined but more risks like a uh, over time okay because as, as some of the people some of the bad actors are out there what they're doing is they they start up a legit, a legit business for three four five six months okay and it appears that it appears like it's a completely legit business they have all the they have all that so so the transaction goes through whether the customers or or or, or um our suppliers uh, but at some point something goes weird okay and, and and to to do that it's it's more complex so that's why we needed better data and that's where we decided to um for for, for for that and other use cases, uh, mm. build, build data mesh. But but as a business unit, okay. So I was attached to a risk organization, um, and and um, so we were a little bit off from the central data team, as well. So we, so that that's how we started it, and. Uh, so we've identified, you know, we've identified all our needs, like a good project. We went to the to the we went to the board. We started development, um, and then we had our and that was in the middle of the pandemic as well. So, uh, so we had um, we, we 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 met finally, and we realized that what we were building. I, I like to, to you know the the, the DNA of the monkey and the dna of the human i think there's a, like a two two percent difference um so we were building a monkey and and then we found out that actually jamak was creating a human mm. way, okay and we said okay well this is very similar to what this girl is describing in her book okay so let's just align and everybody went on board and say okay let's align and let's build the data mesh and that's that's how it started but the thing is we didn't say hey let's let's build a data mesh and mm. because it's, it sounds fun we had a business problem and data mesh was a solution so and and then then it, it became a, a you know a natural process in a, in a few months we had our first data product we had our first demo we we started having this different planes and different toolings for the different planes as as Jamak describes it um, and uh, and uh, we we went into production by the end of uh, 2022 so so it was you know it was we went we were on time and under budget. Congratulations. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's pretty rare. I've I've got to I've got to I've got to remind me of that uh, a few times. But uh, yeah, yeah, we had a we had a fantastic team, and I had a fantastic Dang. boss. And uh, yeah, I mean, just a quick aside: How did you manage to accomplish that? Because I, I think most um, tech projects tend to be over budget and late. Um, so. Yeah, we 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 had a so so we followed we followed agile methodologies from the software mm. perspective. Okay, we we divided, we really also divided and, and concur, um, in in a different in in different aspects of how we could do it. We our our strongest our our biggest problems was really to integrate with the existing system at PayPal, uh, because building the software in isolation that was that was kind of easy peasy okay um you just have teams architects developers great people that works um when you need to integrate with existing systems that started to be a little bit more problematic uh and that's where the bulk of the time um actually was 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 spent okay but uh but we we had this sidecar architecture so we could adapt quite easily to, mm -hmm. to whatever shit would come to us okay so um so that's that's how we that's how we make it yeah so yeah and what so once this got deployed uh how did the business interact with it did it solve the business problem that you set out to solve were there surprises 
it, it solved uh it well the first thing is it was a version one right i think it was post i would say more than a, a, just an mvp but it was a version one it solved some of the business problems um not not all of them um but they were they were they were planned to to be solved after For, uh, the first version didn't um uh, focus mostly on data discovery um and that was because that was one of the problem and also the, the life cycle of the engineer to get or the analyst to get access to the data okay so how do you get access to the data so so that was one of the thing uh we we solved in the first in the first version um then uh documentation was one big thing and the integration with notebooks because mm. a lot of people were we're working in in well, still working with with notebooks and so the integration with the data products and the mesh with the data product was 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 what what we solved so i would say we 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 at least tackle part of all the the requirements we had we didn't fulfill that with the first version but we continued after um for 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 like a good three months after on that yeah Oh, I love this emphasis on data discovery. I, I don't think we do that enough in this industry. Um, so Ole Banyu wrote this book on the enterprise data catalog. His background is in library science, and that's his whole thing. Like make the data, make it possible to see what's out there for all the stakeholders. We're still doing a poor job of, of doing that particular thing. When we mm -hmm. talk about data mesh, that's like a very core part of it. Yeah, yeah, and 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 uh, I think Ole has, has has great ideas, and, and the company he's working with is also uh, exposing a lot of this new concept, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, Xenia, right? Yeah, to yeah. the to the to the point where they don't call data catalogs anymore; they call data marketplace mm. because data catalog is too old. So it's, yeah, it was kind of funny. I was talking to Ole the other day, and and he's like, "I heard it. I heard when you talked in Paris last year, you said that." Uh, data catalogs are stupid and i was like oh is he gonna grill me on this one and i was like yeah i think they're kind of dumb um then he said uh oh it's me too i was like okay perfect um so i uh so i was like you set up here but yeah I, I, their approach is uh i think a bit more um it's a bit more forward thinking right i i, I don't think and i'm joking to the audience i think data catalogs are terrific but the, the problem is nobody uses them that i've seen it's just like you put all your data in there once and it's like um it's like a safe that you you know you go into it when you need it so there's, there's an organizational component i think that needs to be talked about but that's a podcast for a different year so <laughs> it, it reminds me of the old card catalogs you know like you see in the old ghostbusters in the new york oh, City the libraries yeah library, explain library to the younger audience here what is a card catalog that so it's these uh, drawers <laughs> that have index cards in them you've probably seen index cards somewhere and each index card has a book on it and they're supposed to be alphabetized and in, in various ways so you can have sorting by topics you can have sorting by title sorting by author and if you want to look up a particular author you have to go to that part of the cat art catalog and you pull out the drawer for the a's and you go down to a Okay, maybe it's parent. In fact, in fact, so uh, you you go to the P's, E. You, you try to find through all these cards the appropriate author card that has the books on it, and then you try to go find the book on the shelves. And I, I think in practice, um, car, data catalogs often become that kind of fusty tool where people just don't use them. And I think Oli's vision was actually quite different. If you read his book, it's almost a vision of like internal Google search for data, where it's very easy to find anything without having to go dig through the stacks or something. Yeah, and 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 to 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 add to that, I think it's a criteria for for looking for stuff. You know, you were you mm -hmm. were mentioning this all these index cards, but it's I want it goes back to the SLA, okay? So 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 because I want this data but one of the criteria is that the freshness or the latency is less than 2 days. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and and that's okay. A data catalog can do it, or a data marketplace can do it. But you've got to be able to capture this, and that's where the data contract comes into 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 the game as well. Okay. So um, I, I even I, I tried to coin um, something called the data quality of service, so data QoS. Mm. Okay. Like like mimicking a little bit the QoS in networking, but where it would embed data quality 
and the SLAs. Um, because I think I think those those guys are really close together. Yeah. And and uh, data quality is often like okay, this range of value or or um, this com this level of completeness or whatever. But the SLA is also how you actually approach a thing. So I think separating them is is interesting, but combining them is as a quality of service is opening new horizon i think <laughs> i think so too and uh, yeah it's um it's funny i was actually just uh in the course i'm working over uh, just going over a part on data quality now so i think it's what i find interesting is that people like yourself i think who have come from more of a software engineering background are now um you know, applying a lot of these same principles to, to data, right? Um, and I think it's I think it's really cool to see. Uh, I think for the longest time, you know, data sort of existed as a um, you know, sort of a back office type thing, really, right? And so, um, and, and you kind of get into the notion of uh, modern data engineering standards. Um, what what are some of those core uh, kind of software engineering principles that you're you're um, you know looking to I don't know, bring over if that's the right way of putting it. But, uh, you know, you did mention QS, for example, is one of them. What, what, what are some other ones? Well, the, the, the one that, that that comes to mind really is is really agility, okay? Um, mm. um, I think that I'm not trying to oppose waterfall to agility, but the thing is um, agility had 20 years to prove itself in in software and nobody's doing it very rarely or for very specific reason but mostly people are doing agility now and 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 it works okay it's, it's, it's a track record that shows that projects are more successful that products are more adequate etc cetera, etc cetera. so so this this agility helped and as a consequence of that is this product thinking um mm. and, and i and i think that that's you know, you've seen the scenario where a consumer of data, he needs a data, um, is going to ask everything possible, you know, like, a, uh, I don't remember what the quote was, but oh, if you ask a data scientist what data he wants, it's going to be all the data in one table. Um, and and, um, and and so... So if you if you if you if you completely open the gate, that that's what happens, and and if you, you know, if you have to press a tick to place a ticket, and then a team takes it, and 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 then it's going to be when they have the time, et cetera, et cetera. So the classic waterfall and and and, uh, and system tickets and tickets and tickets system. Um, this this is very unpredictable for for consumers. They don't know when they're going to get it, and if there's a problem, well, they don't know when they're going to be revisited on this thing. Okay, so so it creates it creates this this need of oh, I'm going to ask for for everything possible, so so that I I don't mm -hmm. have to to go back to the team to ask them, and it it creates bad blood by definition. Okay, so so but if you if you have a product team and say, okay, well, I can start with that, okay, knowing that there's going to be a new iteration of that, of, of the product, okay, I can start with these five fields and see how it works. And, and then I can, I can, that, I can maybe use that. And now you've got a data mesh or with, where you have exposed several data products and you can easily combine them. You can probably do it even in a self service way, okay? So, 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 uh, and, and I see that it's not science fiction. I've seen that more and more working okay we were scott Elderman and i we, we were at in barcelona in january and okay. and, and globo uh is is working like that they've got now like 800 data products okay in six wow. months yeah so so it's creating another problem but a problem of the riches which which we can solve differently but and that's where i guess data marketplaces where which are smart which are leveraging the slas that are in the data contract can can be better, so so it's very. I think it's very exciting because a lot of the things is we we came from. Hey, I need to move this data from this database to this parquet file. Okay, please yeah. do it as quickly as possible. And um, 
to a to a way where the marketplace is can kind of help you say hey oh the data already exists you can pick it here and you can subscribe to it and by subscribing governance will be aware that you're subscribed and and so so you're you're solving a lot of different issues with with this modern way of thinking okay so the, the, you know at at paypal the integration was difficult we I, I still have I have a lot of great friends there, but changing the mentalities is the biggest, most difficult thing. Okay, so, so so and I think that uh, the and you know when Jamak in her book says about data mesh that it's a socio technological platform, I think nobody understands enough of the socio part. <laughs> it's very underrated. Yes. Yes, very underrated. Um, data contracts too, right? I mean, data contracts are all about getting different teams to interact more appropriately and to really share knowledge when things break. I mean, yeah. What 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 I, what I tell to people about data contracts is is uh, you, you're totally right, Matt. When you say that that people, you know, it's it's a change, okay, and people are resisting to change, okay. That, that, anyway, but there, the work they have to do when they have to fulfill a data contract is very similar than the work they have to do when they when they deploy or deliver a data set because the the additional work you've got to do in a data contract is publish a data contract but you still have to do the documentation okay you still have to do the data quality but if you do that once at the data contract level and then a tool takes the takes the information from the data contract publishes it in the data marketplace, publishes it with the data observability tool or the data quality tool, then you've done the work only once. <laughs> Is the tooling available right now? Not completely, but you know, like Suda, for example, is doing work on data contracts. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the on the documentation part, you, you you've got basic things coming out uh you've got our friends at datameshmanager.com that is also doing things there um so so we're we're we're, we're getting there yeah and it's a progression right? it's a progression yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's agile okay. yeah i mean it took, it took it took a while for microservices i think to to get traction too that was and that's i wouldn't say it's the same thing but it's sort of the equivalent ish of um you know how we how we handle data again it's not a one-to-one -one comparison but i think it's a comparison um, yeah bart has a question um how do you curate a data marketplace if you have 800 data products it might become hard to find the data product you need so part question part statement <laughs> um well I, I i i'm not going to make any any self-serving plugs but <laughs> Or do whatever um, <laughs> you've, you've earned it at this point. I yeah, I would say that you do. Yeah, you you can you can go ahead. And go ahead. But but I think I think that's 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 you know it's, I said I, I went back to being an entrepreneur, but that that's the kind of problems I I want to be able to solve yeah. because I see that you know uh, it's global for example is a, is a nice company. It's not a small company. It's not a very large company, but it's a nice sized company. So if they come to eight hundred data product in six months. You can see that there's there's going to be definitely definitely some things that needs to be done there, okay. So you need to be need to be able to merge some of them. You need to be able to at the next iteration combine them or uh, deprecate them. And and you can't do at eight hundred. You are at the limit of doing it manually. So that's that's where I think the the the, the modern, you know, we are talking about modern data engineering standards modern data engineering practice but the modern data engineering tooling needs to come in and and rely on those standards to be able to to simplify that and uh, so the question that we like to ask everybody is um how do you how do you think uh ai fits into this um so for, for i think i think ai i think ai is a use case um um so, 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 when we're thinking of what what I've been talking about data mesh in, in the context of PayPal and and and, and other customers, it's mo it's mainly in the context of analytics. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not in the case of operational data for not not yet. I, I 
I filed a patent for it, but 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 I think it's 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 it could be there, but right now it's mostly analytics. The 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 role of AI for me it's super analytics at this point. Okay, uh, so you need to have very good quality data that is coming into your AI, either to create the model or to enhance the model with RAG, for example. Okay, uh, and and if you do that, you need you definitely need something that can assure you that the quality of the data, another data quality as you know, as just great expectation or soda, but the data, the quality of the service that is being provided to um, to, uh, to 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 the model, okay, or to the extension to the model. So I think um, I think they are more demanding on that part because the consequences are more immediate, uh, or the consequences are can be even very expensive just to create a, a train a model, okay. So you bring shit data to a model, you train it for, you know, a week and you've burned a million dollar training it. And then you've got a, uh, and then you've got more data coming in. So you better, you better be sure about what's, what's getting into your model. Um, and that's why there's a lot of pressure also to, to understand what's already in the public really available models as well. Um, and not just trying everything against a pile, but, but the thing is, so that's, that's, I think that's where that's where it fits. Okay, so um, now the the way that AI can can do I I, I love this this uh, vision that IBM showed a, a few years ago. This AI ladder, and the last step, the last stage of the ladder was infusing data, uh, infusing AI. So you yeah. take you, you take the result of this AI and you put it back in your system. Okay, but then the thing is, and that's where. I think governance and data contracts on AI contracts maybe eventually have, have a really important role to play because you're taking the result of an AI and then you're reinfusing it into your system. Yep. This can be almost scary at some point. <laughs> the feedback loops are interesting for sure. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And you need human feedback loops everywhere because, and you mm -hmm. need to have them really well, well integrated as well. And Jamak describes that pretty well in the book as well. She does. Yeah. 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 Actually, I like your uh, AI contracts. It's a, I've heard that, but I think it'll be. Okay. Just, uh, Let's say I coined it so, because otherwise, um, otherwise um, Andrew is going to say I coined AI contracts. So when he's on the podcast and I actually, and he says it, you can say, oh, well, that, that's a good, uh, good description <laughs> of it. I like that. Um, Maybe we need another debate or a beef <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> About yeah, Andrew's so nice, though. I, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, he's just—he's he's the nicest guy in the universe. So, and so, so is uh, so is uh, John George. Um, actually, Tamara, uh, Tamara has a question. I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, regarding AI use in uh, marketplace build, um, one way AI can be leveraged is mapping and linking elements across massive amounts of data. An example of 800 data products. On the question of quality, um, although AI could help you, wouldn't you want human validations to manage, maintain, and enhance training over time? Um, Maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, th I, think, I, th I think. I think. I think. I think. I think human validation. <coughs> it's like you know. It's like it's like when you're thinking about it, you know one different software and, and and data as well as you do you do you do peer review. Okay, when you when you pull you do a pull request or something. This is a this is one way of validating it. So maybe this is one way to do it as well with with AI and, and validation. Okay, something else. It needs to be in your almost CI CD pipeline. Okay, so so yeah. otherwise, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and it kind of reminds me of um, how social media companies will. Uh, hire uh, fact checkers and just people looking for uh, abusive content because uh, you know, social media is at such a scale that I would think that would be automated, but obviously then that has its own set of risks. And so there's still people validating even, you know, it's, it's like billions of posts a day, I'm guessing. Right. So that's yeah, a good question. I guess in some way you'd, you might want to like statistically sample things and just, you know, um, kind of like you would in an assembly line. I mean, uh, that's exactly, but. exactly. I love, um, you know, I've, when, I love the analogy with the assembly line because, because it, it, it works well also when you're thinking about, uh, um, about data products or about, uh, uh, because, because 
or, or just just the idea of federated you know a, a lot of people say are, are are against a centralized system okay so and then they say okay then the opposite of centralized is decentralized and i i would say i'm kind of a little bit disagreeing with that the, yes the, op the complete opposite is decentralized but it's it's also proven not to be really successful but mm -hmm. federated is is probably the way to go mm -hmm. and going back to the to the to the assembly line you've got the people on the assembly line they know their shit they know what's going on they know when something is wrong okay if you ignore this knowledge there's no way someone in the enterprise level of headquarters somewhere is going to get this information. Okay, that's where mm -hmm. federation is really important. Federation yeah. of the knowledge, I think. I agree. Yeah, and a vendor's not going to get it either. I mean, they help you with the tooling to help your process, but at the end of the day, you still got to have the domain knowledge. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, you have that. If you don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, uh, Jason Taylor, who used to be called LinkedIn user. Um, it says, you mentioned that tooling needs to come in and help with the prior scenario where um, the person mentioned 500 data products or 800. Um, I'm curious, he is curious about your thoughts and how the process changes prior to tooling. Um, he says, we jump straight to the tooling answer versus an upstream correction to how we get to, uh, uh, say, 500 data products in this case. So. I, I, we, went to, we went to jumping to the tooling because... In the case, I, I don't want to speak for Glovo, uh, but um, my understanding, and I agree with them, is that they are in a in a in a in a building phase, in a growing phase. Okay, so um, was I expecting seven hundred or eight hundred in six months, or or even more? I I don't know. Okay, maybe mm -hmm. maybe not. Okay, but the thing is, do you want to stop? Now that you've started the, the machine, do you want to go back to your data scientist and your user and say, well, guy, actually, uh, you're not using the tool anymore, or you've got to follow this whole process again, okay? Um, so so I think that that's where, um, as Mrs. Vasquez was saying just before, that's where maybe AI can help, or this is where uh, the tooling can help, or, or someone can help, okay? Uh, I just think this is... a for me, it's an easy, easily automatable task, especially when you're relying on on data contracts, for example. Okay, because you've got so much richness about what you're what you're dealing with, that that simplifies a lot uh, your 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 work. But I wouldn't try to to to, to slow them down in the, in adoption of, of a platform. Okay, but uh, but you know, having some kind of a funnel, maybe the first level are you know 800 data products but uh if they want to have a certified or you can have numerous data you know you can have digital badges for your data products and if you want to have level two you've got to go through all these things and etc you can you can be super creative about about how you want to evolve the situation but don't i wouldn't i think it's difficult enough to have people adopting your new product so if they have people creating 800 data product as six is every six months that's a win <laughs> yeah that is a win <laughs> and it kind of goes back to this comment here if i can find it um uh I can't remember who asked this or said this but there needs to be more evidence of success it's hard to drive energy and trust without examples of value for effort but if you're pushing out 800 products right i mean i think that's that's pretty good Obviously, it, if the products are you are useful, um, but I think you would also know that. So, and, and and they're not made by a central data team, right? They're made right. they made they made by the users themselves. So that's okay. Cool. Um, so, and and that's where, for example, at PayPal, we were not to that point. We still needed the team to build the data product for you. Um, but but so the self service was was component was not completely there, but. Um, but if if you have that level of engagement, uh, I think it's I think I'm going back to it. I think it's just fantastic. I just I just love it. You know? so, so 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 you you just yeah. It's 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 it's. I'm jealous. <laughs> but it's cool to see though, right? Because I mean, you hear stories like this. I hear stories like this, and it, and it makes me happy, right? Because it shows that. Um, you know that vision of um, you know decentralized uh, you know data products. Uh, it can happen, right? I mean, it, it is happening. 
So, cause you know, it's, it's sometimes I, you know, I go onto social media and I see people saying, Oh, data mesh was, um, you know, that it's all dead and it's a waste of time and stuff. I'm like, no, I mean, I, I, I hear of cases like where it's working, you know? And, and I think that's, that's the proof you need, whether or not, you know, you want to call it whatever you want to call it. I think that's, that's on you, but at the end of the day, people are getting benefit from it. And so you know, that's, um, that's what I, matters. I think I think I think you, I think you, I think you're spot on. You know, um, when you're thinking about what Gartner said a few years back, that that uh, you know, when you look at the, the, the curve of adoption, um, uh, and they were saying that um, data mesh w was was dead, like r almost like right away, right? And and uh, um, not even not even before the the the, the, the doomy part of of the of the and I, and I think we we I think they were they were wrong on this one. I think that data mesh was probably where they situated on the curve at the kind of the hype part. Mm -hmm. We are a little bit past it now, uh, and um, and and probably there is a little bit of deception, okay, on people being deceived by it. Okay, yeah, makes sense. But we're how close are we to the bounce back and, and say that hey, there's really some success? I, I hear success. Scott Illman is is hearing a lot of success yeah, about, about all that. So, um, so, so yeah, it's really. I, I think, I think, I think we will see some positive things coming out. Okay. Oh okay. yeah. And, and Jamal's still working on a product too. Oh, she is. And I joked with her, you know, a, a bit ago that like AI is probably the best thing that happened to to, to her in a, in a lot of ways because it took the, it took the pressure off. Right, it took a lot of the attention off, and now she can just focus on, you know, actually making a product and making a company versus just everybody and their dog chasing after data mesh, um, you know, and and I, I think renaming it or you know just, just abusing the idea of it and the term, like, you know, a couple of years ago, I think it was peak uh, data mesh washing or mesh washing as we called it, and it was just everybody was a data mesh vendor all of a sudden. Now all the same vendors are magically AI vendors. I don't know how that happens. It's just uh, they must have a really, uh, you know, flexible team and skills and everything, but they just data mesh here, AI over here, who knows what's next. Yep. Um, you know, but that, but I, I was glad to see that it happened because I know that it was, um, it was just, it's, it reminds me a lot of what was happening with the, the you know, the, the modern data stack discussion last week and the week before, which is he sort of, um, yeah, as Tristan Handy from DBT put it, the, the modern data stack became a meme on itself. And at that point it kind of deserves to maybe you know, take a break. So it, it, it's, it, it might be, it might be self-serving at some point as well, but, 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 uh, yeah. but, uh, no, but, uh, going, going back to data mesh, so data mesh is for me, um, in, in it is for me for really, I, I really strongly believe in it in, in the, as a future for most data platform, if not, if not, if not all, um, mm -hmm. As 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 that, uh, I think the I, I wrote a blog a post on on the PayPal engineering, and it's actually the, right now it's the fifth most popular blog post on the PayPal engineering on Medi on Medium. So if you guys can just go there and click a little bit and clap on it, that I can go to the fourth place. That would be great. Um, and and um, um, and, and but but anyway, I think I think I think it has it has not shown all its potential yet no not, not uh, even and uh, and uh, um, I'm I'm I would like to hear more about Jamak's vision okay so uh, I'm, I'm doing a conference for Pi day and I'm, I'm trying to convince her to to to, to come and, and and talk and talk to us about it but so so hopefully 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 nobody will tell her but uh, yes uh, she's she's invited and and uh, I or me a bike, so hopefully we can do that. Uh, it's not like I totally won't send her a text message that she should be going to this after the call. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, please do, please do, please do. Uh, That's cool. So, what do you have coming up? I, uh, you know, I want to give a, 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 a five minutes left, but I want to give you know a plug for um, some of the work you've done so far. Uh, you've written these uh, fine um, books here. 
uh, data contracts for all ages and data mesh for all ages. They're actually really good. I, I read them and I, Thank I, you. I, if I can read them, then um, <laughs> it, it's, it, they're... You, you, you were not a really the target audience, okay? But but uh, I'm happy you did, so... <laughs> you say that, but... Um... Have your kids read these, Joe? That's the next question. Like... No, nah, they're busy playing Fortnite. Kids don't read okay. books. All you right, yeah, yeah. They have no time to read <laughs> No, Milo's actually reading War and Peace right now. Um, oh. Yeah, he's like, I want to read that. I'm like, okay. That's a good paperweight. I like that. Um, so but he's doing it. But yeah, uh, this one too. Um, this just came out. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about this book? So this 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 book um, is 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 this one. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a great book on modernizing architecture. I've been involved as a as an enterprise architect in in um, many organizations, and um, and I think that a, a lot of uh, a lot of the approach that we are putting into architecture is not as structured as it should be and not, not as rich as it should be. And uh, Nick did a, an excellent job in, in, in doing that. I contributed very modestly to this book um, on, on the part with data. But but uh, but the overall idea from Nick and and it's a very it's a very nice book. It's a very so you wrote nice book. the um, chapter on data mesh uh, revolutionizing I, yeah. data engineering and let me just go to that so I can show it. Yes, um, it's yes. actually it's I need to read that chapter. I'm going through chapter three. I'll yeah, and, and you've um, got nice you've got nice uh, nice uh, planes explanation and things like that. So, yeah. yeah, good graphics. Um, yeah. I'm I'm also writing another book right now with uh, Eric Broda on uh, oh. implementing data mesh. Really, it's going to be published uh, by O'Reilly. I did. Uh, I left. I left Manning for this one. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not going back, but uh, different different publisher. No, uh, O'Reilly was a bit of a child's dream to to you know. So, um, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, so implementing data mesh is, is about taking all the ideas we we had and uh, uh, and Eric and I we 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 work on a few things together, but we have different ideas. We just put them together in a book and we 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 try to make it consistent. Uh, so so that's that's an interesting thing. When I when my my first published book was this one, a Spark in Action. Uh, oh, second edition. I remember that. Yeah. So so old school. A little old school now, yeah. yeah. Uh, published, uh, published um, in twenty twenty. Uh, this this was compared to compared to the fall all ages. You look, that's that's pretty thick, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, so this one, this one was more like a a, a, a solo work, right? Really, is the idea is, uh, oh yeah, I want to publish a book, and it was three hundred pages on Spark. Took me three years. I said I'm not going to write the first book, but I'm going to be to write the best book on Spark. I don't know if I achieved that, but that was a, that was that was my goal. Uh, and um, and uh, it was um, it was it was a lot of things. And the the consequence of that saying that I'm not going to write a book by myself anymore. Okay, any any time. Okay, mm. so, uh, because it's too much work. So that's why I partnered with Nick. And that's why I partnered with Eric. Uh, so yeah, so that was that was the fun thing. That's cool. Yeah, Co-authoring is fun, right, Matt? It is. It was very intense. Um, <laughs> Joe and I had to go through like marriage counseling afterwards. I think we literally <laughs> we had to go through, through it. We literally we went through so. counseling. I'll <laughs> say that. I'll say that in public. That's like true. it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Matt's different than me, and I'm different than Matt. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So, so give us a preview of the new data mesh book that you're writing um, when you say like how far into technical implementation are you going to go and how much is the emphasis on the other hand on the sociological organizational side? So, so we have we have um, we have three parts in the book. We divided the book in three parts. The first the first part is really about uh, um, in a way, summarizing Jamak's book in one chapter. Okay, uh, uh, so so, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I would recommend that I I, I like to see our our book as you know volume two of of Jamak's. Okay, so you read Jamak's first, that and and then you can read ours. Um, but but basically, the idea is the first part is that okay, you get get into it, and and we try to follow a use case about about climate change. Okay, and, and collecting climate data. So that's our kind of use case we try to to, to follow along. Um, then we then we um, we go to the technical part, which is a little, trying to focus more on the architecture and the implementation. All right? That's a thing like uh, that's what on purpose Jamak left out of our book, I think. Uh, um, and and we don't go to the code level, 
but we go to the almost almost a story level okay so so if you if you're thinking about the, the a user story in, in 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 agile we we try to go almost to that point okay to to to, to that level of details and we we start by um the general architecture then what's what's a what's a data product or data quantum how you assemble them how you place them on a plane and 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 we added also a chapter on Gen AI on and um, sure. and and uh, and data, and then the third part is all about the, the people. It, it's just about how do you manage this thing? Uh, what's the what's the specific team topologies you want to apply for 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 that? So that's that's what we try to do in the in the in the book as well. Okay, so so it's 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 a socio technological book. Yeah, that sounds really cool. When's it going to be out? Uh, so there's a few chapter on, on Safari uh, or the O'Reilly learning platform already, um, but there's uh, we're, we're targeting a release for uh, October, November, so don't everybody can have it for Christmas. Why don't we have you back on the show and we can talk about it when it's uh, out? Sure, yeah, maybe awesome. with Eric as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't. Yeah, be good. Um, awesome. Well, it's a pleasure uh, talking to you. Um, I, I feel like we'll be talking more because you're you're really cool. Well, yeah, so. already an hour. <laughs> Yeah, already an hour. It feels like it was only uh, five minutes. Um, awesome. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. Uh, for people who want to learn more about you, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, go to LinkedIn, uh, but don't be a stranger. Just don't click on connect. Usually, I'm so far, I'm filtering a little bit. But just hey, say, hey, I've heard you and Joe or, uh, um, or whatever. But yeah, I, yeah. I, I, try, I try to, you know, if it's not obvious that I know you, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I understand. So, um, cool. And then Matt, uh, any uh, anything going on this week? Uh, just the upcoming conference in Switzerland, basically. So I will see you there shortly. It's called Skiers and Data. Yes. So you happen to ski, and you happen to be in data, and you happen to be in Verbier, Switzerland, or near there. Um, come say hi. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, totally won't be a rambunctious party at all. I'm kidding. Uh, so, no, um, but I mean, last year, a lot of great conversations, like the talks are great, but just the opportunity to connect with so many people in the industry that you might not see otherwise, uh, mm -hmm. kind of a bit of a, I, I think it's still pretty American focused, but it's also a bit of a European access event, whereas we're maybe used to going to a lot of American events. And so it's a bit of a different, uh, different meeting of minds happening there. Uh, mm -hmm. Shout out to Chris Tab. Thank you for putting that together. He's probably yeah. already left the comments, but if he's there. Thank you some verbia actually from what I heard, but we'll find out. Yes. So anyway, um, awesome. Well, I got to go. I got to get actually get ready uh, for a meeting and then have to go fly right now. So um, great to see you. Um, and next week, uh, we don't have any uh, guests. I'm guessing that Matt and I will probably cook something up when we're in verbia and then um, just uh, post that up. So anyway, stay tuned and have a great week. Take care, everybody. Safe travel, guys. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, au revoir.